With your permission, I'll call this session of our conference to order and welcome you hearty souls back from lunch for our penultimate session. Thank you. Our first speaker today will be Grant Underwood, and for many of you, he needs no introduction. He has been a stalwart in the practice of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, particularly more recently in terms of his leadership with the Joseph Smith Papers. Um, I, I would also like to remind you of the, uh, the reception his first book got, Millennial World of Early Mormonism, and his editorship of The Voyages of Faith, Exploration and Pacific History. I think it's um, fair to say that he has been long a voice for uh, a history of Mormonism that exceeds the Anglo experience. So he, he deserves recognition, continuing recognition for that. I, he re, you can see from his, his, uh, the brief bullets in the program, uh, as I said yesterday, the name, rank, and serial number of all our speakers, so I won't rehearse that to you except to acknowledge that um, the, the strength of their training uh, that they bring to their work. Uh, he will address us first, and then afterwards, uh, Brian Birch will talk um, from a different scholarly point of view, not history, but from ethics and religious studies. His degree is in the philosophy of religion, is that right, Brian? And these, of course, are very welcome uh, vantage points from which Mormonism is increasingly being explored. And Brian deserves credit for organizing that effort uh, in terms of the Mormon chapter, the Foundation for Interreligious Dialogue, and for his being on the board of directors of Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. And then I'm missing here, Brian, the, uh, the uh, Latter-day Saint organization. The Society for Mormon Philosophy and Theology, forgive me for that. So in many ways, Brian has not only been a leader at USU in, in uh, shaping uh, the, from its earliest beginnings the, the Religious Studies program at Utah Valley University, but also in uh, ordering, as we Latter-day Saints like to call it, the uh, philosophical study of Mormonism. So I will turn the time now over to them. And they have told me they have gotten Spencer to give them 18 minutes. So, Good afternoon. I begin my, by expressing my respect for Richard Bushman. I started collecting Bushmaniana over 30 years ago as a young college student. Virtually every page of my well-worn copy of Bushman's then brand new Joseph Smith in the Beginning of Mormonism is filled with color markings and marginal notations. From that point forward, I have been a hardcore Bushman fanboy. As N.T. Wright said of the great 20th century New Testament scholar Charles Cranfield, he showed the next generation what it looked like to hold together massive scholarship and deep personal faith and commitment. Richard's consistent faithfulness, his gentle wisdom, his penetrating scholarship and his pastoral heart have blessed me and many others for decades. With my paper, we descend from the delightful and Olympian heights of theoretical playfulness to address for a broad audience and from a historian's standpoint, three basic questions suggested by the title of our colloquium. Is there a place for Mormons in the academy? Is there a place for the study of Mormonism in the academy? And is there a place for Mormon values and beliefs to inform work done in the academy? The first question, whether Mormon scholars have a place in the academy is easily answered yes today. In ever-growing numbers, particularly over the past half century, distinguished scholars who happen to be Latter-day Saints can be found in almost every academic discipline. Indeed, some surveys find they are disproportionately represented in academia. Happily, the bad old days of blatant discrimination against highly trained, exceptionally talented scholars 
from historically marginalized sectors of society, whether because of religion, race, or gender, have largely passed. With a few exceptions, Mormons today who learn and play by the rules of the academy have the same opportunities as any other scholar in their field. While playing by the rules of the academy may not be difficult for the devout Christian when one's field is mathematics or mechanical engineering, how about in the realm of religious scholarship? Here, one of the cardinal rules of the academy is to recognize that its methods do not provide the tools necessary to determine the reality or presence of the supernatural. This means that ultimate truth claims must be set aside or bracketed out of the academic study of religion. The goal, explains practitioner Stephen Stein, is not to declare one or another's religious group or experience to be true and all others false, but rather to understand the ways these religious communities and experiences have functioned in the lives of their members and the roles they have played in the story of our nation. The academic study of religion <clears throat> is not about Excuse me, the academic study of religion is about investigation, not indoctrination. About analysis, not catechesis. And its objective is to probe, not propagate, particular religions. When I describe to my LDS students the academic ground rules for the study of religion, it at first seems to them that such an approach asks that they abandon the testimony-bearing part of their identity. Then we discuss a statement by Margaret Miles, former dean of the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. While believing strongly in the divine re revelation of one's own religion, she writes, one can still recognize that its beliefs and practices emerged in history as human efforts to give form and substance to that revelation. As human products, religious beliefs, practices, and institutions are always in need of critical scrutiny. Their effects, not merely their intentions, must be acknowledged and examined. Lest this seem like a high-level cop-out, I remind my students that no less a figure than church president Spencer Kimball had this to say to Mormon scholars, quote, your dual concerns with the secular and the spiritual require you to be bilingual. As LDS scholars, you must speak with authority and excellence to your professional colleagues in the language of scholarship. And you must also be literate in the language of spiritual things. We must be more bilingual, he urged. LDS Apostle Neil A. Maxwell, after whom our hosting institute is named, put it this way. For a disciple of Jesus Christ, academic scholarship is a form of worship. That gets my students' attention. It is actually another dimension of consecration. Hence, one who seeks to be a disciple scholar will take both scholarship and discipleship seriously. In the decades since President Kimball made his remarks, mastery of the language of scholarship has become ever more apparent among Mormon scholars of religion and religious history. Consequently, a number of 21st century markers provide a clear yes to the second question. Is there a place for the study of Mormonism in the academy? First and foremost is the proliferation of books and articles about Mormons and Mormonism that have been published by top-tier university presses and journals by many in this very room. Second is the recognition by national scholarly institutions that the academic study of Mormonism is both possible and desirable. In 2005, largely on the strength of Richard Bushman's academic track record, the National Endowment for the Humanities, for the first time accepted a Mormon topic for one of its annual summer seminars for university professors. Two years later, the American Academy of Religion approved inclusion of a Mormon studies group 
in its expansive family of thematically focused units. Almost concurrently, the first endowed chairs in Mormon studies appeared at non-Mormon universities. These milestone ac acknowledgments signal that enough academically acceptable work on Mormonism has been produced, especially in the last half century, that the study of Mormonism is now a viable, vibrant, and full-fledged part of the academy. The third question, whether Mormon beliefs and values can successfully inform scholarly work in the academy without violating its procedural protocols is more complicated. With regard to the discipline of history, the question parallels the discussion that has been taking place at least since 1948, when at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association, Yale historian and missiologist Kenneth Scott Latourette delivered his famous presidential address, The Christian Understanding of History. Is there, or should there be, a distinctively Mormon understanding of or approach to history? At the very outset, we are confronted by the challenge of identifying that which might distinctively be called Mormon. Years ago, Perry Miller remarked that what one finds in 17th century New England is one-tenth Puritanism and nine-tenths a culture common to all English people. Yet their attitudes toward all sorts of things, he wrote, are pounced upon and exhibited as peculiarities of their sect when, as a matter of fact, they were normal attitudes of the time. Much the same can be said of Mormonism. While the question of how to do Mormon history excites little theoretical discussion today, when I was a young grad student and fledgling member of the Mormon History Association, it was a hot topic. MHA conferences were much smaller then, and I can vividly remember cramming into the hotel room of Leonard Arrington or Jan Ships or Tom Alexander after the day's sessions had concluded to get down to the real business of debating the proper nature of Mormon historiography. More articles and essays were published in the 1980s on how to do Mormon history than any decade before or since. Reference was often then made to an address Elder Boyd K. Packer delivered in 1981 at a convention of LDS religious educators in which they were urged to see in every hour and in every moment of the existence of the church from its beginning until now the overruling almighty hand of God. Although Packer was addressing teachers of LDS youth, he cautioned Mormon scholars elsewhere about writing history as they were taught in graduate school rather than as Mormons. What exactly he meant by that was vigorously debated. And at the end of the day, Mormon historians, encouraged by President Kimball's call to bilingualism, press forward focusing on demonstrating their mastery of the language of scholarship. To this day, both because of the methodological imperatives of the academy and because of the improbability of attaining a God's eye view of the past, in any case, most Mormon historians embrace what others have called the Marsden settlement. Along with his many other historical interests, George Marsden spent the final quarter of the 20th century exploring what history, quote, as a Christian might entail. Since God's work appears to us in historical circumstances, wrote Marsden, the actions of the Holy Spirit in the church are always intertwined with culturally conditioned factors. Therefore, and this is the Marsden settlement, the historian should refrain from explicit judgments on what is properly Christian while he concentrates on observable cultural forces, by identifying these forces, he provides material which individuals of various theological persuasions may use to help distinguish God's genuine work from practices that have no greater authority than the customs or ways of thinking of a particular time and place. In other words, Christian historians should leave the theologizing 
to theologians, just as Mormon historians leave pinpointing God's particular interventions in history to those they regard as apostles and prophets. Indeed, for the 10 years I worked as a volume editor for the church's Joseph Smith papers, we were explicitly told not to make theological judgments, let alone attempt to identify God's actions. None of this, of course, says anything about the ultimate reality of God or the possibility of divine intervention in human history. Some have suggested that leaving God out of history is like trying to describe a football game where half of the players are invisible. I would change the analogy by saying that all the historical players are visible, but the divine coach is not. Depending on one's view, God may be calling some, many, or all of the plays, call this revelation or providence. And, unbeknownst to observers, he may also be slipping performance enhancers, call it grace, to the players. But this is not visible to ordinary human observers. Only when the game is over and the coach discloses his actions will the full picture emerge. Meanwhile, without denying the possibility of divinity or its involvements, most historians like myself prefer play-by-play, -play, like play-by-play -play sports broadcasters, prefer to focus on what is visibly happening on the field. Recently, though, some Christian scholars have argued that the Marsden settlement does not go far enough. They contend that history writing more overtly informed by Christian perspectives sh could contribute to the moral and spiritual advancement of humankind. Yet there are obvious liabilities with preaching through history, even when it is not explicitly Christian. John P. Diggins on hallowed ground presents Abraham Lincoln's political philosophy as a panacea for current American woes, but Gordon Wood rejects such an instrumentalist approach to history as perilous to the discipline. Diggins, writes Wood, thinks of himself as an intellectual historian, but in fact he is not a historian at all. He is a cultural critic who uses history to preach to modern America. Historian David Hollinger notes the resistance of some mainstream historians to studying religion. My chief instruments for overcoming this perception, he writes, have been the works of religious history that do not carry the marks of religious apologetics and can be easily incorporated into the episteme of modern scholarship. A good example is Jane Shaw's 2006 volume, Miracles in Enlightenment England. Shaw practices the traditional historian's virtue of empathetic identification with historical subjects, enabling her reader to recognize how vivid the evidence for divine intervention in the form of miracles appeared to many persons in early modern England. Yet, one can read Shaw's book with deep appreciation without being required to believe that a supernatural power actually caused the experiences to which so many English Christians testified. Much the same can be said and has been said about Richard Bushman's treatment of Joseph Smith and early Mormons in Rough Stone Rolling. Here then is the sweet spot for historians of religion to represent religious experience in ways that seem plausible, even compelling, without making claims to normativity or ultimate truthfulness. For this reason, many of us who are believing historians do not see great promise in attempting to more overtly infuse distinctive Mormon beliefs or claims to divine intervention into the histories we write. Such works wrote Richard years ago, always seemed stilted, forced, and artificial. I decided that the answer was not to force myself into an orthodox program of history writing. Rather, to write godly history, I had to be more godly. Along with seeking that sweet spot, as Richard has so admirably done, his latter comment 
identifies a tantalizingly worthy pursuit for any scholar in the academy and the subject of another paper. Thank you. Thank you, Grant, and thank you, Kathleen. In 1955, Sterling McMurrin presented a paper at the Great Issues Forum at the University of Utah entitled Religion and the Denial of History. Among his many provocative claims that evening, McMurrin asserted that religion undergoes its most severe testing when it is, quote, studied and discussed seriously by rational and informed persons with open minds and honest intentions. As I reread this essay a few months ago, I imagine Richard Bushman sitting in the Orson Spencer Hall Auditorium, ruminating over his response to McMurrin. And I confess, having spent the last few months writing on McMurrin, I've had several of these occasions where I've imagined Sterling and Richard engaging one another from their very different angles of vision. Of course, we all know that Richard meets all of the conditions specified above. Here is a person who is rational, informed, open-minded, and impeccably honest, and yet who comes to very different conclusions about the implications of history for lived religious experience. Richard, the impact of your life on, and work on me has been deep and profound, and I echo what many others have said here in this conference. You not only occupy a place in my heart, but you frequently take up residence in my head. And for that, I am grateful. It is a privilege to be part of any event that honors Richard Bushman. With that said, of course, I must provide the requisite disclaimer that the content of this message does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or positions of Richard Bushman or any of his subsidiaries. The extent to which religious beliefs are tested by appeal to logic and evidence has been a deep and abiding fascination of mine. And in that, I, I share many of McMurrin's uh, uh, ruminations. So I'm going to open with a handful of questions that, that help uh, guide what, uh, what I'm about to say. Question one, how much secular knowledge can Mormonism accept without eroding the claims of the faith? Two. How vulnerable can Mormonism be relative to critical inquiry into its history, theology, and culture? Three, how does Mormonism navigate the distinction between the empirical and the spiritual? Four, how much disagreement is present within the LDS community regarding the role of academic scholarship in studying Mormonism? Five, what metaphors, scriptures, and narratives have been employed in thinking about the relationship between secular scholarship and the LDS gospel? Six, what has been the effect of these narratives in shaping the educational culture of the Latter-day Saints? And seven, how effective have these been in response to the acids of modernity? These, of course, are huge questions that require careful and sustained attention. For our purposes, I will focus on a few features that are, that are informed by my own fields of study, namely the philosophy of religion and theology. Of course, I have no pretensions towards settling any of these issues here in this 15 minutes. Rather, I have as my aim the effort to perhaps clarify some questions at stake, to help map the terrain a bit, and to briefly point in a direction I believe Mormon studies should go on its best days. Given the events of the past few months and years, there is no better time to be exploring these questions together as a community of scholars. We are all witnessing the dramatic growth of publications in Mormon studies, as Grant pointed out, the development of institutional programs of study, and the ecclesiastical support for more academically oriented scholarship. We also know that these developments have not come without their share of struggles, tensions, and misunderstandings. These obstacles and challenges have been informed by a number of considerations that come from both American academic culture and the particularities of Mormonism. As one would expect, the debates within Mormonism mirror, in some respects, broader debates in the academy. In other respects, not so much. For example, 
Mormonism has not had any particular stake in the debates regarding the role of theological education in the American Academy of Religion as compared to most other Christian denominations. Among the distinctive features of the Latter-day Saints is the perpetuation of a lay clergy without regard to professional studies in theology, ministry, or religious education. The absence of divinity schools and related academic programs has contributed to an environment in which LDS clergy and institutional educators have, by and large, been removed from the dynamics of both theological and religious studies. Despite this fact, there are any number of key issues that have, I believe, profound implications for the study of Mormonism. For example, a prime debate in the academy has been the extent to which theology serves as a protective strategy in the face of critical scrutiny. Scholars such as Donald Wiebe and Russell McCutcheon have spent the better part of their careers arguing that theology has no substantive role in understanding religious phenomena. For them, there is, and this is uh, McCutcheon, there is a tremendous gulf that exists between scholars of religion on the one hand and theologians on the other. Examples of what they find objectionable can be readily found in Christian apologetic discourse, particularly as it relates to religious experience. William Lane Craig provides a dramatic illustration in his discussion of Christian knowledge. He says, and this is Craig, I shall argue that the inner witness of the Holy Spirit gives us an immediate and veridical assurance of the truth of our Christian faith. Rational argument and evidence may properly confirm but not defeat that assurance. For the sake of this presentation, I will call this the immunity principle. That is, the idea that certain religious beliefs are immune or insusceptible to revision or abandonment. This unidirectional approach to Christian belief has long been an object of tension in religious studies, in part because it raises crucial questions regarding the very aims of academic inquiry. Critics have long maintained that the appeal to religious experience subverts the, the very legitimacy of academic inquiry. Because rational methodologies are subsumed by religious narratives and concepts, the entire enterprise is said to be hopelessly undermined. We all recognize the resonance, of course, between Craig's appeal and that of many Latter-day Saints. In both cases, religious, fun religious experience functions to provide the secure footings required to withstand the storms of secular scholarship. And these considerations invite us to ask the following questions. Where and in what ways does the immunity principle manifest itself in the lives of the Latter-day Saints? What specific claims are understood to be categorically immune to revision? What are the implications of this situation for advancing the academic study of Mormonism? And finally, does the immunity principle lend itself to forms of anti-intellectualism? Returning to Craig, it is interesting and somewhat ironic to note that in his consideration of rival religious experiences, he explicitly rules out the legitimacy of Latter-day Saint accounts. And this is worth quoting at length. Why should I think that when a Mormon claims to experience a burning in the bosom, he is having an experience qualitatively indistinguishable from the witness of the Holy Spirit that I enjoy as an evangelical Christian? Why should I think that the cognitive mechanism that enables me to form a belief that I am a child of God is the same mechanism that produced the psychological experience he mistakenly identifies as the witness of the Holy Spirit? Of course, from the perspective of the Latter-day Saint, Craig is the one with the mistaken psychological experience, while she is said to possess the genuine witness of the spirit. And off we go into a battle of legitimacy regarding their respective experiences. And time does not permit me to go further into this, but I will say that in both cases, the goal is the same, namely to invoke religious experience as the final court of appeal in cases of perceived conflict. This form of immunity, of course, raises all kinds of interesting and mischievous questions. How do we proceed uh, given the existence of conflicting religious experiences? That's just one question. Uh, how do we proceed based upon uh, the 
the diversity and the susceptibility to delusion that many uh, charge that people who have religious experiences uh, undergo. And these are just two of the questions that are, that are part of the discussion. These considerations lead me to a final point regarding the question of method. I have argued elsewhere in favor of a kind of methodological pluralism in approaching Mormon studies. One purpose of these arguments has been to identify the conditions under which apologetic voices could maintain a seat at the table and contribute in academically productive ways to the conversation. One criticism that emerged from my uh, publication is that I failed to maintain a strong enough firewall between apologetics and religious studies, that I was too inclusive and did not pay close enough attention to the long-standing division of labor between the two. This is a fair criticism, but it's only fair if one accepts the traditional non-overlapping magisteria approach to this relationship. And I'm referring to uh, a term that was coined by Stephen Jay Gould in his discussion of science and religion in which he says there is no ultimate conflict between science and religion because science deals with empirical claims and theology and religion deals with spiritual and moral claims. Thus, we're not doing the same thing. Never the twain shall meet. I, for one, do not accept this approach as a necessary starting point. In fact, I would go further and add that much of this division of labor talk in religious studies contains theoretical difficulties. The key point here is that one cannot assume at the outset that a theological account does not or should not play in the same space with religious studies. Some theologies are explicit in making rival empirical claims that are in principle testable and thus subject to the same kind of scrutiny as scientific claims. Other theologies are self-consciously non-empirical and lend themselves to different forms of critical appraisal. And so I would, I would just add here that, that Grant's approach and my, uh, my approach are very different. And uh, in talking to Grant uh, in a hotel room in Chicago a few weeks ago as we read each other's papers, it became clear that we approach this from very different angles of vision. I want to make it clear that I am not defending theological or apologetic claims. Rather, I am simply calling into question the basis upon which one side is able to dismiss the other because each feels justified in, in subsuming or imperializing the claims of the other within their home categories and narratives. My idealized intellectual community is one in which these two approaches productively engage one another in terms of the ways in which they imperialize one another and what this means for their respective projects. If one person's datum is another person's axiom, shouldn't this be the subject of probing discussion rather than grounds for intellectual dismissal? I say this not in the interest of expressing some kind of Rodney King, can't we all just get along sensibility, but rather to insist that quality scholarship demands it. It is an unfortunate fact that the history of Mormon apologetics has been spotted with episodes in which the best virtues of scholarship and goodwill were lacking. It is also unfortunate that the culture of Mormon apologetics has not been a more reciprocal endeavor. But it didn't have to go this way. We can imagine a history of Mormon apologetics in which it was more humble, dialogical, and rigorous. If this were the actual history, would there be the kind of polarization that we now experience? I don't know, but I think it's worth asking. And by polarization, I'm referring to uh, the recent transitions involving the Maxwell Institute and uh, the role of apologetics uh, as uh, BYU and other universities like the University of Southern California uh, try to settle on what their approach is going to be to these issues. Further, I wonder how much the attempts to draw a firewall between Mormon studies and apologia are informed by interpersonal and cultural considerations rather than genu genuinely academic ones. Engaging with and learning from one's critics is an essential part of academia. So the extent to which apologetics is truly an academic endeavor, it is, in my mind, obligated to be in conversation with rival paradigms and theories. To the extent this happens, it will, be once, it will be at once both painful and therapeutic. 
painful because it will lay bare the bad arguments, inaccurate histories, and anachronistic evidence that we've all witnessed. And it will do so in reference to evidence and arguments that have, for various reasons, been afforded sacred or reverential st uh, status. It will be therapeutic because it will create live possibilities for thoughtful people who are rightfully dubious of some of the traditional apologetic narratives. Finally, in Birch's utopia, Mormon studies would be the ideal interdisciplinary field of study. It would go far beyond the mere presence of different disciplines. It would involve genuine interdisciplinarity. Scholars from a variety of disciplines, methodologies, and outlooks would actively engage one another to explore how these different approaches bear on a given topic and how they bear on each other. Of course, I do not mean to imply that this has not happened and has not happened well. It certainly has, and I am grateful for it. But I would like to think that much more could be done and needs to be done to advance the field in the most productive way possible. And at present, I see reasons to be both optimistic and pessimistic regarding the prospects for healthy intellectual dialogue in and around Mormonism. Thank you. In introducing our commentator, uh, I, uh, it is a and it is a privilege to do so. Uh, we are again indebted to Richard's uh, deep personal relationships to bring into our company one of the Academy's finest scholars. Richard Brown is on the Faculty of History at the University of Connecticut. He is the Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus. He specializes in the study of the colonies, revolution, and pre-industrial society and culture. His current research interests are racial, ethnic, and religious equality in early America. And of course, those are each areas that are of such uh, interest to contemporary society that it makes me want to point out the obvious but seldom seen particular expertise of a senior scholar that can engage the past to illuminate the present without doing violence to that past. And I think that Professor Brown is, is one of those rare academics. He has been past president of the Society of Historians of the Early American Republic and the New England Historical Association. He's held fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among others. His current uh, project, which will, is forthcoming from Yale, is Self-Evident Truths, Contesting Equal Rights from the Revolution to the Civil War. He's published much else. I recommend it to you, even if you're not in the field directly, as I've reviewed his titles. They are wonderfully instructive to how uh, to um, introduce your work on a book jacket. For example, Taming Lust, Crimes Against Nature in the Early Republic, tried, convicted, and condemned in almost every bar room and barber shop, anti-Irish prejudice. So I now give you Richard's dear, dear friend and esteemed scholar, Richard Brown. Thank you for your too generous <clears throat> introduction. I always think it's better if expectations are lowered rather than elevated before one speaks. And I also want to join in the litany of gratitude and thanks for those who sponsored this convocation. And I want to particularly thank Jeremy King for being very, very helpful in just local arrangements and, and uh, getting us here. And uh, finally, I'll say a, a word of appreciation for Richard Bushman, but just a word, enough has been said and I don't want his head to get too expanded. Um, I, I thought before I begin my formal remarks, it, it would be appropriate to speak about my first conscious encounter with Mormons, which occurred when I was in my 20s and I was in Toulouse, France with my wife who was 
<coughs> completing research for her doctoral dissertation. And we were at home one afternoon. I was in the study, and she was somewhere else in the apartment. She answered uh, a knock at the door, <coughs> and two young gentlemen, coats and ties, began speaking to her in rather halting French. And she responded and said, are you American? And they happily responded in English that yes, they were, and they were missionaries. And, you know, would, would she speak to them? And Irene said, well, she didn't think really that uh, she and I were suitable fodder for conversion. But it was a warm afternoon, and she said, well, why don't you come in, and we'll just have a conversation. So she brought them in, and she brought me out from the study. And she didn't make iced tea, but she made uh, lemonade. And we had a very nice conversation. And they were happy to have a respite from uh, knocking on French doors and finding either no one home or no one interested in talking to them. My first reaction then to uh, this Mormon missionary effort was what an astonishing degree of self-confidence Mormons had to imagine they could come into a country where there was you know, 1,200 years of Christian history, lots and lots of established religion as well as contests over religion and anti-clericalism and, and to think that here is a fertile ground where uh, this upstart American religion uh, could take root. Uh, but they had that confidence, they persisted. My first encounter with Richard Bushman I think is perhaps illustrative of one of the points that was made yesterday about the extent to which being Mormon, serious, conscientious Mormon, uh, could inform one's scholarship and affect one's scholarship. Because the first uh, conversation I ever had with Richard was at, a, I believe, an American Historical Association conference in Chicago, I believe in 1698. It wasn't that far ago. 1968. <clears throat> and he was a commentator at a session on two papers uh, on early American history. And they were good, solid papers. But Richard's commentary was remarkable. Why was it remarkable? It was remarkable because he summarized the themes and argument points that the authors had made and then brought them to a new level. And he saw connections between them. And he created a higher level of generalization than either of the authors had themselves seen and brought to it a kind of uh, sense that we're in a collaborative endeavor these two authors have given us wonderful building blocks, and this is the structure uh, that we may build together. And it struck me then, and it continues to strike me, as really the beau ideal of what a critical commentator can do, that is, appreciate what it is the authors are uh, trying to say, and then uh, attempt to go beyond them uh, to create a, a deeper level of understanding. And as I listened yesterday to the aims of how one's faith would inform one's scholarship, it struck me that this was a, an example of that. Now, I should also say that I don't think that that mode of, of commentary is exclusive by any means to Mormons or to Christians. But I do know that uh, I also spent a little time studying in England. It's definitely not the English style of uh, commentary and criticism, which is really, this is a little exaggeration, but to savage uh, the papers that have been given and to preen 
and to show how much wiser uh, you are than the people who just give the pa gave the papers. So uh, I thought that, uh, and so after it was over, I went up to Richard, introduced myself, commented how much I liked his work, uh, Puritan to Yankee, I, I think that had appeared by then, uh, and appreciate his commentary, and, and that began our relationship. So this is a very learned gathering, and it's a, it's a learned gathering in which virtually everyone here knows more about much of the subject than do I. So this isn't false modesty. This is real modesty. Um, so I, I do want to begin with an apology. Uh, few people in this room know less about Mormonism than do I. And no one here, I suspect, is less qualified to offer insights on religious studies. Given that ringing claim to your attention, perhaps it would be best if I followed the wisdom of Proverbs 17.28, which declares, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. But for the sake of our thoughtful and better qualified paper givers, and to honor Richard Bushman, I will ignore the wisdom of scripture and strive to fulfill my promise to comment. Grant Underwood's remarks on Mormonism in the Academy are a little different now than they were when I read them, not remarkably so, my first reading of them was that they were perhaps unduly apologetic. Uh, in the version that I just heard, they were, I think, less apologetic. But I would say that in many and indeed most areas of academic inquiry, I see nothing in Mormon religion that would be an impediment to the search for truth. Certainly in the fields of mathematics, physics, engineering and the natural sciences, there's nothing that I know concerning LDS teachings that would compromise scholarship any more than the contents of most other religions. The only exception would be biblical literalism that denies the findings of geology and biological evolution. And that literalism can apply in virtually all of the Abrahamic faiths. Happily, that is not an issue that need concern us. Some might suspect that Mormon belief can handicap scholarship in the human sciences, anthropology, psychology, and sociology. And it, perhaps it does, but I do not see why that would need to be so unless the scholar chose to impose Mormon teachings on her or his observations. As in the natural sciences, the first task of the human scientist is observation, data collection, and description. A Mormon might filter those observations according to the teachings of faith, but so might a Buddhist, a Catholic, a Jew, a Hindu, a Muslim, or any of the many varieties of Protestants. The serious scholar strives for objectivity and while its achievement may never be entirely total or pure, the challenge of objectivity is not distinct for Mormons. There remain several areas of academic inquiry where concern about Mormon bias may be legitimate. History, philosophy, and religion. Let me start by saying there is no historian I hold in higher esteem than Richard Lyman Bushman. No one I know tries harder or more successfully to investigate historical sources and to listen to them carefully and conscientiously. That is why he has become one of the profession's master scholars. Nevertheless, there are scholars I know and respect who have criticized his Joseph Smith studies because Bushman is not critical of Smith and the origins of Mormonism. But I am not one of those critics. Why? 
Though I have been trained to be skeptical, an outlook that is temperamentally congenial, I cannot find fault with Bushman's treatment because his work is scrupulously informed by and descriptive of the sources and their contents. Nor does Bushman shy away from recounting contemporary critics of Smith and his followers. Bushman is not a lawyer arguing a brief. Instead, he invites his readers to judge for themselves whether Smith was or was not a genuine prophet. Let us consider his approach by way of analogy. For many years, I taught the history of New England's Great Awakening, and by, in studying it, my students and I read the Reverend Jonathan Edwards' account of the revival as he witnessed it in Northampton, Massachusetts and surrounding parishes. Edwards was one of the great, learned, and sophisticated intellects of his era. Many believe he possessed the best mind in colonial Anglo-America. Moreover, he was an eyewitness dwelling at the epicenter of the religious awakening, and he described it in detail as it was happening and shortly thereafter. His was precisely the kind of eyewitness account that historians hunger after and that we are seldom so fortunate as to possess. Now yesterday, David Hall instructed us that Jonathan Edwards manipulated texts. Uh, I would say, however, that notwithstanding Edwards' ecclesiastical politics, we can have no better source of insight on the Great Awakening in the Connecticut Valley uh, and how and why that awakening occurred. So how did Edwards explain the phenomena that he witnessed so closely? He explained it as an outpouring of the Spirit of God. My own belief system leads me to be skeptical of that explanation. And yet who am I to rebut a brilliant, conscientious eyewitness observer? I will not rebut Edwards. I can doubt him. I can hypothesize alternative explanations of the awakening. But it is a fact that I do not know why it happened. For me to dismiss the testimony of Edwards would be not only arrogant, but parochial. The same, I believe, is true of Bushman's account of Joseph Smith's prophesying and the golden plates. I am skeptical of that account also, but I am not prepared to dismiss it. And what I so admire in Richard Bushman's recounting of early Mormon history is his readiness to expose his readers to the sources, to describe them faithfully, and allow readers to draw their own conclusions. Here we see a rare scholarly humility. Other scholars, non-Mormons, have generally felt compelled to dismiss, jo to dismiss Joseph Smith as a fraud. In short, they have allowed their own religious beliefs to dictate their interpretation. From my own personal perspective, one might as well declare Buddha, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, and everyone else across history who dealt in the supernatural as frauds. Some scholars, such as Bertrand Russell, Christopher Hitchens, and Richard Dawkins, have made that choice. But it is not a choice that enlarges understanding of history or of humankind. If I understand correctly, there is at least one aspect of the Book of Mormon that does not stand the test of academic scholarship, and that is the idea that the Native Americans were descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. But if Christian, Jewish, and Muslim scholars do not have to defend the historical accuracy of the Old and New Testaments, then I don't think Mormon scholars are compelled to do the same for the Book of Mormon. None of these texts was established according to the canons of critical academic scholarship. 
Let me turn now to the fields of philosophy and religious studies. Recently, I read that a 2009 poll of academic philosophers found that 73% described themselves as atheists. What are we to make of that concerning the study of religion? Does that mean that the 27% who are agnostic or have some belief in God are or are not qualified to investigate religion? Logic suggests that inasmuch as all have some belief system, either a tilt against religion or in favor of it, either all are qualified or none is qualified. So if the study of religion and philosophy are to survive, all of them must be qualified. If atheists and Catholics can be unapologetic scholars of religion, so too can Mormons. It might be useful here to distinguish between Mormon teachings and Mormonism. Mormonism, I believe, is the behavior of self-identified Mormons and understanding that behavior can only be enhanced by the social science and humanities disciplines. Irene Brown, my wife, suggested it would be useful here to consider what William James called the varieties of religious experience. One must, of course, understand and analyze theology. But in addition, one needs to consider the roles of music, dreams, meditation, the performance or theater of rituals, and even the neuroscience of religious experience. And please forgive this disciplinary special pleading, but one must also consider the histories of peoples, their literatures, and their religious experiences. Consequently, I would argue that from a disciplinary perspective, the study of religion offers extraordinarily wide horizons. Leaving religious studies to those trained only in theology or philosophy is far, far too limited. Let me conclude by suggesting that while Mormonism may be uh, intellectually vulnerable, as Brian Birch puts it, I doubt that it is any more vulnerable than any other religious belief system. And if other faiths can withstand secular study, why not the Mormon faith? In matters of faith, there will always be doubters and skeptics like me. And faith is not, I think, amenable in the end to objective critical analysis. Faith questions cannot normally be proved or disproved. They are matters of faith. So insofar as the academy welcomes diversity of viewpoints, Mormon scholarship ought to thrive. Thank you. We now have 15 minutes for your questions on what I hope is a popular subject for you, one that has crossed your mind before, either as you have read or as you've written history or other subjects. Anne, are you looking at me with particular intent? <laughs> this will give the rest of you time to warm up. Anne is usually quick on the draw. Yeah, well, I, I've been thinking about what Grant and Brian were talking about for a little while, so. Okay. Let me, I want to, uh, throw out the distinction between uh, description and explanation and see if it goes somewhere in terms of the two ways that you guys approach this topic. Um, by description, I mean, I think what you were talking about, Grant, in terms of sort of limits of what historians do and um, religious studies, I don't mean description in some just narrowly parroting back kind of way, but I mean trying to get inside the point of view of the people that we're trying to study, analyze that really carefully, what I assume that you're talking about with uh, Shaw's book. Um, 
and that when you say in that mode that we're refraining, what do, I, what do you say here, uh, without having to believe that an actual power was active, it seems to me that's a move of ref refraining from trying to explain in your own voice as a historian or scholar of religion what you thought was going on. And then Brian, I have to confess, I, I was very blown away by the Steve or the William Lane Craig thing that you were quoting. So I think I found w the book that you were citing. Is it Reasonable Faith? Um, yeah, well, uh, Find the Need in Apologetics. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I found another but place where. Does say the same thing in there. Okay, right. He sounds like a real Methodist. Um, anyway, <laughs> it strikes me that when he's talking about the witness of the Holy Spirit in the way that he does and religious experience as the witness of the Holy Spirit, he's both describing and explaining. I mean, if we go back to Wesley, you know, and his heart strangely warmed, the actual descriptive phenomenology we can talk about there is that he felt, you know, something going on in his chest. And then he said, oh my God, it's the Holy Spirit. So I would see Craig doing that same kind of move I mean, he's not unpacking it, but he's both describing and explaining in one fell swoop. And then you're highlighting that between different traditions, you know, you've got these different explanations. But I think even within traditions, there's all these long histories of, you know, strategies of discernment, trying to figure out if it's really the Holy Spirit. Um, so, I'm just thinking that, some, this is back to the question here, it seems to me that some kind of distinction between deep sort of phenomenological analysis and explanation in whatever voice, if we're gonna do it in a secular voice or in a theological voice, that those are two separate activities and we can differentiate those voices. And so I'm wondering what you guys think in terms of your different points of view on this. I, uh, I think we all admire your work, Anne, on this type of thing. I, I want to come back and ask you a question. So you, you, you pinned that down beautifully with my example of the Shaw book. So would you have me or any other scholar, after all that kind of deep, nuanced analysis and description, would you have me or any other scholar move to say something about, I mean, and beyond the fact that in the representation of that set of experiences, it's been repeatedly noted that these folks saw this as the action of the Holy Spirit, etc. That that's, and just like in Richard's book, that he regularly uh, talks about revelation. I mean, the word revelation or revealed must appear a hundred plus times in the book. But would, would you have us move beyond that kind of presentation to as now the observing scholar to say in our voice something more definitive or kind of resolving by way of explanation in terms of where that came from? Um, I think we can. I, I, I like the way you put it. I think it's actually, for me, I think it's a really good move to separate those two voices, you know, to have the voice where we're trying to understand the other, whoever it is historically or ethnographically that we're trying to understand. And then to me, and I'm doing this myself, I think it's fine to move into our own voice, make our premises clear. You know, if it's a theological voice, if it's your voice, you know, as an, as a, Mormon, if it's my voice being, you know, sort of naturalistic Unitarian or something, you know, that that's cool. I think we have to lay out what our premises are. And frankly, I think 
for Brian's kind of inner religious philosophy of religion dialogue, doing that might be helpful there too. I think that people that are trying to be straight out theologians, if they could separate out those two modes of analysis, it might further the conversation. I had a note to, to myself when I went through that section to, to acknowledge your work, Anne, because it's been so helpful to me and many others in, in, in contextualizing religious experience and looking at it from an interdisciplinary you know, set of perspectives. What I was doing here was uh, referring to the, the, the epistemological literature where uh, some philosophers of religion uh, have used religious experience as what I call the final court of appeal in terms of not having to acknowledge or respond to the, the results of, of critical inquiry. And that's exactly what Craig is doing here in these books. He's saying, uh, the witness of the Holy Spirit is so strong in me that, and it's uh, the kind of experience it is, is self-authenticating, such that I don't need to consider the results of scholarship that are contrary to what the Bible says and my experience tells me. Uh, and not only do I need to not appeal to uh, you know, critical inquiry, I don't need to even consider the existence of other conflicting experiences, which I briefly refer to, like that of the Latter-day Saints, because of course their experience is false. It is a purely psychological phenomenon, and I know that my experience is the genuine witness of the Spirit. And what I'm trying to say is, I have no idea where to go from there in terms of trying to uh, understand you know, these traditions. If that is the final court of appeal, um, then yeah, as Craig would, would like to have it, you know, uh, the game is over. But part of what I would like to say is that the appeal to revelation or the appeal to religious experience is really just the opening salvo in a whole other set of issues regarding how religious experience functions. This is where Anne's work has been so valuable, right? What is the relationship between religious experience and religious beliefs? What do we do with conflicting experiences? What do we do with the challenge of delusion, right? What do we do about, you know, um, neurological, reductionist accounts of religious experience. All those things are ripe for discussion, but if there is no, no method or no opening to be able to discuss that within a community that depends so heavily on religious experience and which uses religious experience as a way to blunt or block or deflect the, uh, the results of critical scholarship, then, then that's where I get befuddled. Don't quite know what to do. Other questions, Ben? Yeah, my question's for Grant. Um, I, I take your point quite well about there is more work done in the in the 1980s about how to do history as a Mormon than there has since, which makes sense that since then, it, that's not the type of thing that's going to get you a job, let alone tenure in the academy outside of the, the Mormon culture region. But I'm wondering if, if the s stopping that type of a discussion of doing history as a Mormon rather than just doing history as an academic, if that's just temporarily suspended, furloughed rather than an infinite suspension, that might be a conversation that we'd have to return to once Mormons are more established in the academy and you have people at other places. Is this a question that you think that has to be risen again and it's just temporarily put down until there's a, a more firmer base and, and establishment within the academy? Great question. Um, I, I think most of us would probably welcome, uh, I certainly would uh, welcome further exploration uh, of the topic. I think that most of us um, realize there, there are many areas of thought and analysis that we haven't uh, fully engaged or fully enough and there's a place for more. I certainly wouldn't, by making that little note, I was just 
not making a value judgment on the desirability or otherwise of that reality, but just saying it's interesting that it hit at that high point in the 1980s, and obviously that reflected coming off of the, uh, the introduction of the history division at church headquarters, that 10 years there, the impact of the Arrington era, that just stirred up uh, lots of discussion along those lines. And then riding on the wave of that, that's the major impetus. And then you had uh, folks like uh, Elder Packer who said some provocative things that you know riled up the historical community and got them talking about it. So I think there were particular historical circumstances that made the night, and then of course throw into that the whole engagement with the Hoffman documents and how historians were processing the Hoffman document phenomenon, and there was much to be engaged at that particular time. But that's certainly not to say that we couldn't revisit it or shouldn't revisit it. I mean, I think that honestly, this conference has epitomized the quality of the next generation. Mm -hmm. Look at the things we've heard in the last day and a half. I, I, it's been delightful. I can remember when I was a grad student, and I'd go hear things at conferences about Mormonism, I don't honestly recall it having the sophistication and creativity that just what we heard here ranging from our young scholars like Mr. Miller and Mr. Hickman to our seasoned veterans like Mr. Uh, in the back there, the incomparable Terrell Giffens. And we've got folks who weren't in the playing field in the 1980s who are now there and you're coming along, you and your good buddies here. I say go to it. <laughs> but we'll have to leave that to the next conference. We will go to it at the next conference now. We must end this session and prepare for our last session with thanks to this panel for their provocative and very um, helpful comments. Thank you. Thank you.